Biobalance HealthCast, Episode 107, Decreased Estrogen and Depression. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging, covering treatment and solutions that include bioidentical hormone pellet therapy, safe and affordable skin rejuvenation, and spa quality botanical skin care. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. So we're continuing a conversation that we started in previous podcast about linkage of depression and hormone deficiency, but that also incorporates a discussion about terminology. Uh, depression is a term that people use casually and socially. It's also a term that's used clinically in the psychological field and clinically in the medical mm -hmm. field. And to be classified as a major depressive episode, there's a list of nine symptoms. Mm -hmm. And uh, a clinician, whoever's doing, trying to make the diagnosis, has to go through the list of nine symptoms and the individual has to present with five or more mm -hmm. of those symptoms and at least one of the first two mm -hmm. in the list has to be present, and usually both do, but mm -hmm. at least one does, in order to technically qualify. So it's one thing for me to say, well, I'm really depressed because the Rams didn't win on Sunday. Mm -hmm. That's not a clinical usage of the terminology. Being Although I do know people <laughs> who, yeah, I'd be depressed a lot. I do know uh, men who get so emotionally invested in their attachment to sports outcomes mm -hmm. that they will be uh, enraged, outraged, depressed. They're usually betting money. Often, <laughs> often they are, but not always. I mean, mm -hmm. some of them, it, it, it's, it's a magical kind of attachment that they make, mm -hmm. and they really get themselves emotionally distorted mm -hmm. on the performance of a sports team. Mm -hmm. uh, but. So for our purposes today, I'd, I'd like to start by just kind of running through that symptom list yes. mm -hmm. uh, because people will, uh, will at different times in your life, you may be depressed uh, in a social sense of feeling down and feeling negative uh, about some event. You may be depressed in a clinical sense, and that clinical depression can happen because of what's called a reactive mm -hmm. or exogenous event something she, like your mother dies it means real or you mm -hmm. lose a job or you retire from a career mm -hmm. and you're at sea and emotionally you are depressed uh, that's mm -hmm. an externally caused or exogenous depression mm -hmm. it can also happen because of a chemical adjustment a chemical imbalance that happens inside your body that you have no control over and can happen at any time and that's called an endogenous depression that type of depression almost always needs medical treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to take medicine, you need to take a pill, and when you get better, you can come off the pill, but eventually your system is gonna maladjust again. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand, if you're suffering from that kind of depression, that you're gonna have rhythms or cycles of it throughout your lifetime mm -hmm. where you'll need to be medicated. Right. Uh, so I'd like to run through the symptomology and then wanna talk specifically about estrogen and mm -hmm. its impact. I wanna add one thing to all depressions, all depressions that are actually diagnosed mm -hmm. by a psychologist, a counselor, or a physician as a depression actually are accompanied by a serotonin deficit. Mm -hmm. You're, even if it's from reactive. the outside, right. it's reactive, your brain responds by not making as much serotonin. That's the feel-good hormone yes. of, your, of your brain. So it decreases, even if it's something oh, I that's agree. external, it decreases if it's internal. It's actually a chemical drop. Okay, so so it's not just reactive and oh you feel depressed. It actually has a physiologic or biologic basis. Depression is so difficult because you don't look broken, and people that yeah you do your eyes are blank. I mean you can well, look but at you, somebody but you're not and limping. You don't have your leg in a cast. Right. You don't. You, you're not on crutches. There's not a physical thing. People that are around you when you're really limited by depression get real tired of you real fast. Right. Uh, they don't want to deal with you. They, they, they get mad at you. They're like, damn it, you know, you're not so special. Get a, why can't you load the dishwasher? Why can't you fix dinner? Right. All you have to do all day is sit here and watch TV. And, and somebody that's really cripplingly depressed 
can't do those things. They're not motivated. And They're like a sponge, though. Oh, they suck out the energy horrible. of everybody else. It is such an insidious illness at those higher levels of clinical mm -hmm. involvement. And they do all involve biochemical changes, mm -hmm. even if they're exogenously initiated or mm -hmm. triggered. But, but here are the, and, and, and part of what's challenging about it is different people respond different ways. Well, so, the, so the two that's critical what medicine is all about. It's the the two critical symptomologies that one of which has to be present mm -hmm. to have the mm -hmm. diagnosis. Uh, one is a depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, in, uh, indicated by subjective reporting or observation of others. Mm -hmm. So I have to come in and say, my son is feeling this way. Mm -hmm. I see this. This is how he's behaving. I have to come in and say, this is how it feels to me. Okay. Uh, the second one is a uh, markedly diminished interest in pleasure or most activities most of the day, nearly every day. So you've got to have one or two of those. And the rest is where it gets interesting. Significant weight loss when not dieting mm -hmm. or significant weight gain. So some people, when they're clinically depressed, don't eat. They, they, they won't eat. And we have to talk to them about you must force yourself to eat. And they say, nothing tastes good. I'm right. not hungry. I'm not aware of being hungry. Mm -hmm. The hunger chemicals are being suppressed mm -hmm. by the serotonin imbalance. Mm -hmm. And so they're not eating and they lose weight. Other people get so hungry, they are ravenous and they graze constantly and they put weight on mm -hmm. because they're trying to feed the depression and, and fill the themselves. emptiness, fill the hole that's inside mm -hmm. them. So you can not be hungry and not eat, or you can be ravenous and eat all the time. Either one of those can be a symptom of mm -hmm. depression. The next one is insomnia or hypersomnia. Some people, when they're depressed, can't sleep. They toss and turn. They lay awake at night. They stare at the ceiling. They're not problem solving. They're not puzzling. They just can't sleep. And other people sleep all the time. If, they're not, if their attention is not immediately required, you know, the baby is crying, I have to change the diaper, mm -hmm. they fall asleep. They sit down in front of the TV, they sit in a chair, they're in their office, the phone's not ringing, they fall asleep. So you either sleep all the time mm -hmm. or you don't sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, psychomotor agitation or retardation nearly every day. Psychomotor agitation, people make uh, almost stereotypical movements. They, they, I have some clients that, that play, you know, they, they figure out a rhythm or a routine, almost like playing an instrument, you know, mm -hmm. play, playing the air flute. Uh, they will do a rhythm uh, rhythmic behavior, which can be symptomatic of it's depression soothing. or something else. Well, it, it's soothing. It rhythmic is soothing. Behavior is soothing. It, it's also like burning rocking. off adrenaline. Right. Because depression can be comorbid with anxiety, mm -hmm. and it may mask the anxiety. What we frequently find, we treat somebody for anxiety, and, and the anxiety diminishes, it gets better, mm -hmm. the depression manifests. Mm -hmm. Or we treat somebody for depression, the depression diminishes, the anxiety manifests. Mm -hmm. They often happen at the same time, but one is stronger, so the other one right. is hidden. Uh, so psychomotor agitation or retardation, meaning lack of uh, motor movement, lack of responsiveness, flat affect on the face, no facial expression, Usually you, uh, the no eyes energy in the eyes, I, the breathing eyes are is like shallow and, and rhythmic, body is still, uh, preternaturally still. Most people are not that still. Mm -hmm. And they just, it's like lights are on, but nobody's home. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day, diminished ability to think or concentrate, a lot mm -hmm. of indecisiveness. I can't decide mm -hmm. if I want to go to the refrigerator and get a soda or if I just want to sit here or maybe I want to drink of water or maybe, I don't, maybe I'll turn. And they, just, and they end up not moving because mm -hmm. they're indecisive. And then finally, recurrent thoughts of death uh, or recurrent suicidal ideation. Uh, and they'll have like horrible death dreams, nightmares of different kinds of ways of dying that are, that are pretty colorful and grotesque. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a side effect of the medicine they're mm -hmm. on. There are some medicines that cause those. Sometimes it's a side effect of the depression. So when you look at a clinical diagnosis, those are the ingredients that you look at to come up with that diagnostic code. Mm -hmm. 296 point blah, 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 <laughs> uh, depending on what the other factors are. Useless numbers. <laughs> yeah. So there was a recent article in the OBGYN News, October of 2012, right. Uh, which Here. you have in your hand, mm -hmm. that talked about the connection between uh, estrogen and depression. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to that? This article t is looking at the exposure of women to estrogen throughout their life mm -hmm. and then the likelihood of them getting depression at menopause. Okay. Okay, so it's, 
It's the backup. In other words, have you had enough estrogen throughout your life? If you have, then you are less likely to be depressed after menopause. 15% less likely. Right, 15% less likely. If you've had enough all along. All along, right. And, and the pill is a hypoestrogenic atmosphere. In other words, it gives you an environment of low estrogen. Right. So what this would say, that they didn't say this, but th what this would say to me is, someone who has been on the pill their whole life, yeah. when we test their estrogen, it's lower than menopausal when they're on the pill. So I'd say that the pill would increase their risk 15% after menopause if they've been on the pill so their whole life. So some young women go on the pill as a way to regulate their cycle mm -hmm. and the other body chemistry issues they have, mm -hmm. not just as a preventative for pregnancy. Right. They go on it for other reasons. Okay. And so a daughter, say, that went on the pill at 12 or 13, mm -hmm. and then when she gets ready to, to be menopausal at mm -hmm. 41, mm -hmm. if she's been on the pill for 25 years, right. then she's more likely to suffer from depression yes. after menopause. Is right. that, am I understanding you that correctly? You are understanding that. Wow. And nobody says that No, that's on not the on the risk end. forms because this, is, this study's new and the pills have been out since yeah. 1970. Okay. So they haven't ever, and, and the pills have changed in the last 30 something years, 40 years, and that is in the beginning, the pills had enough estrogen. Mm -hmm. So back then, we, we haven't seen enough people who've done this for 30 years on the low dose pills. Right. Low dose pills are a very low estrogen environment. We used to use higher estrogen environment, and then we had risks of, they thought, of breast cancer and other things, so they decided estrogen bad, lower it. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't yeah. make sense because it's such a blanket statement. So they've always decided, oh, estrogen is bad, it's not, it's our one of our very important hormones, but estrogen stimulates uh, serotonin, it stimulates dopamine. I mean, it's a necessary hormone for women and we need it to keep our brain neurotransmitters going. So. This basically confirms that by keeping someone's estrogen low their whole lives, we're gonna have a big risk with these new low dose pills of people becoming depressed Well, now after one of the menopause. things in the article when I read it, 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 they make a reference to estradiol as a type mm -hmm. of estrogen. It's a young woman's estrogen and it's what is in the birth control pill, okay. but it suppresses the higher levels of estradiol that, a young woman would make. Mm -hmm. They're saying that because estrone causes depression, doesn't which, which help it. Which is another form It's an old estrogen. lady estrogen that comes when your testosterone drops, estrone goes up, and estrone, a different kind of, of estrogen, causes depression. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole different thing. So if you chemically suppress estradiol by these low environment birth control uh -huh. pills, uh, does that increase the likelihood of a higher level of estrone? I mean, are they going to get into that earlier than they would have? Or is it just the lowering of the estradiol amount is the connective factor for depression? The estradiol amount is the, connect, is the connective factor mm -hmm. for, that is looked at it in this study. However, t all birth control pills suppress testosterone, right? Okay. Because the testosterone is from the ovary. Right. It suppresses everything from the ovary, estrogen, testosterone and progesterone. So the okay. pill keeps the ovary quiet. Right. So it drops testosterone levels, which decreases sex drive in everybody who takes the pill, which would be oh, good. Oh, that's at, interesting. Yeah, so it works, the pill works several ways. One is to keep you from conceiving. The other way is to keep you from wanting to have sex. <laughs> which is one way you don't conceive. Right, you just go, don't no, not sex. tonight, honey. Yeah. So the pill is, is a negative for having intercourse in several ways. But when the testosterone drops, everybody says, oh, the pill made me gain weight. Well, it wasn't the estradiol in it. It was the suppression of testosterone. People get soft and mushy. They get belly fat. And their estrone goes up. When I test people who are on the pill at any age, they have right. a lot of estrone. They have very low estradiol, the young woman's estr estrogen. Right. And they have very low testosterone. Okay. And so you say That's when, not when a healthy I environment. People, how do you test? I do a blood test. Okay. Okay. And 
what you can test people when they're off the pill to see what their baseline is themselves mm -hmm. but you can test people when they're on the pill their their hormones are the same every day mm -hmm. and so they it turns out that because the pill is very low dose it shuts down stimulation of the ovary mm -hmm. so that means you're not going to make your normal higher doses of estrogen it's quiet all you get is what you're given in that pill which is low dose so i see low estradiol levels like less than 0.5 milligrams, like menopausal level. I see low testosterone, less than 10, less than five testosterone. So it's, it's shut down. You should have 30 or more if you're a young, healthy woman. And then and high the estrone are, level. Yes. So, so initially, this article catches your attention because it talks about uh, depression in women who are menopausal and postmenopausal. Right which you've said through anybody that watches our podcast regularly, you know, one of your concerns is that OBGYNs are trained for the fertile cycle and then women kind of fall off the radar mm -hmm. as far as uh, sensitivity and understanding and knowledge base mm -hmm. about unique predicaments of older women. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's what I hear from my patients. They come in and say, well, I love my OB. They're great when I was pregnant. They're great when I was young and on birth control pills. But now that I hit 40, they don't seem they don't to be interested to in me, me. Yeah. anymore. Or they don't seem to understand. Uh -huh. So this article is saying to you and other, others that are OBGYNs, uh -huh. you know what? When women reach this milestone, depression is very likely to, to be present. Uh -huh. Partly we now understand because of the suppression of estrogen in their younger life. Uh -huh. What you are saying is that younger or older, a combination of testosterone and estrogen, estradiol, mm -hmm. can block that depression as well as restore libido mm -hmm. uh, and mood and energy. It does so many energy. other things. It does so many other things. But estradiol, young woman's estrogen, and testosterone are necessary for a, a normal mood, a good mood. Now, I have many people that come in with depression, uh -huh. and I don't take them off their antidepressants until they've had a really decent response to the pellets, uh -huh. estrogen and testosterone. So after four to six months, I say, go back to your doctor. That's what I was waiting for you to say. You go don't take back, them off at all. I don't take them yeah. off. You go go you back to yeah. the psychiatrist or the internal medicine doctor that put you on this. Right and say, I need to wean off this or I need to go off this medication yeah. because I feel fine now. Right. My hormones are good. Let's see if I can tolerate it without it. Now, not everyone can do that. I right. have some manic depressives. Right. They there are some other reasons they why. They can't stop that. Right. I have some people who have psychoses. They can't stop those drugs. But most of my patients who have just straight depression. Do you have any hysterics? <laughs> no. Okay. Because that term is just not real. <laughs> That's, a, that's a, a guy term. It's a wastebasket term for, I want you out of my office. <laughs> Get out of my office. You're, you're hysterical. hysterical. See ya. Yeah. So, 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 so do you find that other physicians then, uh, especially psychiatrists, are they respectful or responsive? Do they ever contact you and say, how did you accomplish this? Or are they dismissive and like, that woman doesn't know what she's talking about. You need to stay on the depression. Well, so I, I get both responses. Uh -huh. I get both responses. There, there are some psychiatrists that are just happy to have the help. Yeah. Because they've been struggling for years. They've given them every drug they know, and they're still depressed. Yeah. Well, then when I add the hormones, the patient's better. It's so much easier for them to manage. They may still need those medications right. and counseling, but I, they don't I, need it as much. I've now, really found that to be true in counseling. Mm -hmm. uh, because in my experience, at least in the St. Louis area, most psychiatrists practice medicine, not therapy. Right. There are some mm -hmm. who spend the time and do the therapy, but most of them just manage the meds. Mm -hmm. And someone like me does mm -hmm. the therapy. And some of those psychiatrists are very receptive and very open to input mm -hmm. from me. Mm -hmm. And others are like, who in the hell are you? I'm the medical doctor. I make these decisions. I, I don't know. need your, if I need your input, I'll, you know, I'll tell you what it should be. Right. Uh, so, so I'm, it's, I get a, it's a little response. gratifying to me that you get the same. Yeah. Same stuff. Yeah, I do. And I think um, I get that same response from almost every specialty. I wish OBGYNs would look at what I offer patients as mm -hmm. instead of just going, rah, rah, I don't understand it. Just don't do it. You know, rah, rah. right? because uh, that's that's half of them. The other half 
are kind of wondering about it. Maybe I should send my wife. Maybe I should yeah. send my nurse. Yeah. This works with me. I mean, I I have a, a neuro or a neuroplastic surgeon who sends me his whole office. He's like, okay, ladies, you guys are all menopausal. You're going to go see Kathy because I can't take it anymore. My GP sees you. And when I went to see her, she was talking about, well, what do you do? And what, you know, mm -hmm. uh, she became aware of my connection mm -hmm. to you. And she laughed and said, Dr. Maupin is the only reason that my teenagers are alive today. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank God. Yeah, and so some doctors are, are supportive and convinced mm -hmm. and embrace and seek out. And others are still avoiding. I see resistance. lots of doctors of every specialty. Yeah. And their wives and husbands. So, so the word is spreading. Yeah, it is spreading. Thank goodness. Yeah. So it is a concern, and, and so the, the the subset message for today is that the level of the hormone estrogen that women experience throughout their lifetime will have a direct corollary to the uh, incidence of depression after they've gone through menopause. And Kathy's message is not only the depression, but the libido, the mood, the energy, the thoughtfulness can be impacted if you supplement the estrogen and the testosterone. Mm -hmm. That's right. So if you are interested, if you experience any of those things, or if you're online to experience those things, you may want to check out her website. Uh, certainly these podcasts can be helpful, but there's independent information that's out there that you can check. Thank you so much for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. Follow Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Brett Newcomb can be found at brettnewcomb.com.